Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Each summer, our wildlife biologists team up with volunteers to band resident Canada geese around the state. The data gathered today, coupled with additional critical data provided by hunters who are fortunate enough to harvest one of these birds, gives biologists the necessary information to make well-informed management decisions. And that, in turn, results in healthier populations of geese and happier goose hunters. Sound wildlife management, based on real science, just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. My name is Adrian Ramirez, and some of y'all might know me as AJR Outdoors on Instagram. Oh, it's a big old flathead. It's a big old flathead on the fluke. I knew it. Oh my gosh. He hit it so hard. Oh, can't even lift him up. Freaking root. The whole purpose that I have for my Instagram is to share my experiences, but also to inform and to educate. I really enjoy doing that, and so I take it to the next level of just making sure that if anyone has anything they want to know, that I will sit there and I will talk to them for hours if it means that. Aluminum foil dish today. Uh, I've got some lemons, onions, yellow bell peppers, uh, red bell peppers, and I've got some cut jalapeno and cilantro in here. I hope you guys enjoyed today's Catch and Cook. Welcome to my rodeo. Welcome to my rodeo. Welcome to my rodeo. Welcome to my It's deeper than, than just fishing, especially for me and I know a large majority of people. It's not just you're not just going out casting a line and catching a fish. It's it's like a detox from everything. It, it feels good. You you're out, you're just only only worried about what's in front of you, the water, nature around you, and you're enjoying being outside. Guys, for my TV, 22 pounds. Look at the belly. I just post uh, a lot of fish and a lot of like my my techniques and my tactics and whatnot. And I just get like I mean I go all over. I go miles deep into to creeks that no one fishes, and so people just really like seeing that type of stuff. But then I also really take my time to write out my captions and to put information down that people would want to hear or to know about. And so. I think that plays a really important role into um, having that following base want to stick with me. The big thing for me as to why I have my social media is to more or less inspire people, but also just because I, I purely love fishing and not even just fishing, but just the outdoors in general so much that I just like to share the experiences I have because I know a lot of people, you know, might not get to experience these things on their day-to-day -day lives. They might not have these things around them as much. Got one. This is the male. Oh yeah. That's what I'm talking about, baby. They really enjoy seeing these adventures. You know, at some point it does lead to them getting out and getting on their own and trying it out for themselves. And I, I really appreciate that. I really enjoy that aspect of being able to help and teach others. And so 
I guess that's the best way to sum it up is uh, I really like to motivate others to get into this. So I actually had a post in particular that I had uh, filmed down at Keystone Dam. I just had my chest mount with my GoPro rolling. I was just trying to get some footage. And um, when I got down down there, I seen this uh, this man and his son, and they weren't they weren't getting into anything. I asked him if they caught any, and no one was catching anything. And probably about five minutes after I started casting, I hooked into one. First thing I did was ran down the side and just tossed the pole over to his son and just had him working that fish from there and he was absolutely ecstatic and um, that's actually that video blew up and went around pretty good and got to the news and whatnot. There you go, you got it. Hold on tight. He's gonna be pulling hard. Go ahead, reel in, reel. There you go. It's hard, right? Put some muscle into it. You got it real quick. Put this further down. There you go. Now hold it. Hold this. Put hold it right here. There you go. It's for a striper. Okay, hold on. I'll get him. The reason why it's so important for me to to get the younger kids on fish like this is because. First of all, I know how much it meant to me whenever I had people um, putting me on fish like that. I just wanted to make a memory and make him grateful for that moment and uh, it could lead to something bigger and turn him into me and you know, and just want to strive to be like a really big fisherman and that's a wonderful path to go down and if I can put anyone down that path, I will. There's a striper right there. That's a nice one too. Oh, stay pinned, baby, come on. Stay pinned, baby. I don't know, I feel, I feel like uh, a lot of people think that it's, it's too hard for them to get on the water and to catch these fish. They see me and they, they think they go try and they, they go for like an hour or so and they don't catch anything and they get disappointed and, and turned down from it. But it really just, if you want to get on these fish, um, the biggest thing is just being like having perseverance and to put in the time for it. Like I just, the amount of people that ask me every single day, like, what do I use? Where do I go? And all this, like little do they know, I just started striper fishing. Come here you. Oh, is that just a mean hybrid? What is that? Mean hybrid, that's why. There we go. That's a nice one. He smoked the absolute life out of that bait. Woo! The only reason why I have gotten so good at figuring these fish out is because the amount of time I put in. So. If it's, that's really, that goes for anything at all. Like if you want something, just put the time and put the work in and, and you can achieve it. Pretty much the, the number one goal here is to get this bait as far up to the falls as I can. And that is because these bad boys mixed with striper, sand bass, they're all hanging out up there. They want the most oxygenated water that they can get to because that's where all the bait is, that's where everything is. And that's all this has been, being real and working hard. This right here is the reason why I come out here and work so hard to get on these fish because that fight will never get old. And you know, anyone can do this. It doesn't take any special abilities. It just takes a little setup. It doesn't even have to be that much money. And pick up a couple lures. I got these from Walmart. So anyone can do this. You guys can get out on these fish and uh, yeah, this is all I ever dream of right here is catching these line sides. Go ahead and let this guy go. He's good to go. That never gets old, ever.
What I'm throwing today is a, called a rooster tail. It's a spinner type bait. This one happens to be a root beer colored rooster tail that I'm throwing right now. And probably about every 15 minutes or so, if I'm not getting a hit on that color, I'll change up colors or I'll change up weights of the, the lure itself because the weight puts it down in the column of water where you know, you're hunting for the fish in the lair or in a lair and trout tend to hang on the bottom some. This morning I saw them hitting on the top so I put on a lighter rooster tail hoping to run a little closer to the surface and maybe get a top water, more of a, an upper type hit. This morning I saw the, the fish hitting a lot on the surface. So I probably wanted to start out on the surface. As that goes away during the day, as the sunlight comes out, the fish will go deeper, so I may want to go down. And, um, you know, so when you, when you first start thinking about where you're going to start, pay attention to what the fish are doing. And a lot of times the fish will tell you what they're doing. If there's not a lot of hits on the surface, they're deep, start deep. If there's hits on the surface, there may be a bug hatch going on, I start high. No action, I start working my way down. The colors I bring with me, it's kind of a rainbow of colors. Um, one of the other things you think about is water clarity too, where this morning our water's pretty murky. And so if you're murky, you probably want to go, and it seems counterintuitive, a little darker color because they're looking more for a silhouette than they are anything. Um, you know, I've thrown the root beer for about 15 minutes now, water stained, still hitting some on the top, but I switched to a chartreuse rooster tail. In fact, it's almost trout colored with a little red on it. And so we'll see if the, the color change up may interest some of them. Some of what we were throwing today, again, uh, lightweight spinning rod, and I, I like a closed face spinning rod. Um, use light tackle, because you get a 12 inch trout on, it feels like a steelhead. Um, different colors we threw today, from root beer to gold to even a, a crawdad crankbait. This is a crankbait, um, fairly well for smallmouth bass, works great for crappie. This is actually a crawdad. This is a rooster tail, it's got a, a blade on it, a treble hook and some marabou and a weighted body. These are super dupers, they're folded, and so as they swim through the water they turn. Um, again, various colors, and if you'll notice, various sizes for how they sink, all the way through chartreuse, red, black. I used everything from the chartreuse, which I caught a fish on that you saw earlier today, and to the root beer that I caught a fish on that you saw a little later on. Um, and again, change up colors, change up locations. If something's not working, move around, see what it, see what it takes to make it work for you. Again, you're fishing in a trout area, pay attention to the trout regulations. What we didn't fish with today is another method, and that's when we go over to power baits and even to, to worms where you'd use like a, an egg hook and a worm or this actually happens to be power bait dough and if you'll notice it's the floating type and about a size 14 treble hook and I would make a dough ball on it. Again I would use some sort of sliding type sinker tied above my swivel and I would tie this hook on with about 10 inches of what we call tippet material, go to the fly shop or you want to use about four to six pound test monofilament. And um, the, the advantage to mono is it floats. So this would lay on the bottom and then this would let your, your dough balls come just about 10 inches above. If you don't like messing with the dough and it gets kind of putty, you can use what are called power eggs. And these eggs are round, they're fairly solid, they float. And so instead of using a treble hook, you'd want to use something similar to this, an egg hook. I also use the egg hook on the worms. When we talk about power bait like the crappie nibbles here, or I mean the trout nibbles here, um, these are made to suspend under a bobber and have a split shot hold them down. So these actually suspend from the surface down toward the bottom so you can fish the normal way that you have before with a, a bobber, as we say in the, fly, in the fly fishing world, a strike indicator. 
Um, when you throw something like this though, you're gonna to wanna to look at a weighted float to do it because the weight drags the line out so you can cast far, further. So with this type bait, this is surface down. These baits here, bottom up, and then the worms. If you have the, the little air pump, this will keep the worm coming up off the bottom and hold him up. Otherwise, if he gets down in the gravel, he'll start working his way into the gravel. And trout, as you know, aren't really bottom feeders. And um, so these are some alternate methods of trout fishing to fly fishing, or fly fishing is an alternate method to this type of fishing. There are certain areas of the trout areas that this would not be legal. So check if you can use natural or these type baits. If it says artificial lure, now you're looking at flies, spinners, something that's hard, or crankbaits, something like that. If you plan on hunting from a tree stand, pre-season scouting is an important step to ensure a successful hunt. There are several things to keep in mind when selecting a tree for your tree stand. Select a live, straight tree that fits within the size limits in your tree stand's user manual. Be sure the tree is healthy and not dead or diseased. And never place a tree stand against a leaning tree, a tree that's wet or icy, or a utility pole. Once an ideal tree is selected, be sure to review the owner's manual and installation instructions. Always inspect your tree stand thoroughly before installation. Look for any wear in straps, bolts, cables and all other parts of the stand and any accessories. When installing a tree stand, always wear a full body harness that meets or exceeds the Tree Stand Manufacturer Association's standards. Use an alignment's belt connected to the harness ensures that you're connected to the tree at all times during tree stand setup. If you were to fall, the harness and the alignment's belt will save you from potential injury. Climbing sticks are considered to be the best choice for entering a tree stand. Strap each section of the steps snug to the tree, ensuring the steps are firmly gripping the tree trunk. Next, wrap the lineman's belt around the tree and fasten it to your full body harness. As you continue affixing the climbing sticks to the tree, the belt will save you from potential falls to the ground. Continuing on, place the next section of the steps firmly onto the tree. As you climb higher, carefully slide the lineman's belt with you. It's important to clear away any branches or obstructions that may interfere with not only your lineman's belt and harness straps, but also with your stand. Once your desired height is reached, it's now time to affix your harness strap that will be fastened to your full body harness. The strap shown here works similar to a vehicle's seat belt device. There are also numerous Tree Stand Manufacturer Association approved ropes and straps that use the basic Prusik knot. Using a haul rope, carefully pull the tree stand up. It's important to have any excess rope or straps out of the way so that you or the stand won't get tangled up. Using a new ratchet strap or a chain, strap the tree stand firmly to the tree and be certain that it's snug. The tree stand platform should always be at least 18 inches below your top step so that you step down onto the platform. With the lineman's belt unstrapped, you can now enter the stand. The tree strap that you connect to your harness should be placed right above you on the tree. Check the stand for any movement and be sure that you have a comfortable range of motion free of obstructions. When getting out of your stand, always keep your full body harness strapped to the tree. Once safely on firm ground, disconnect your safety strap, 
and affix it onto the bottom step so it'll be ready next time for you to enter the stand. Hunting from above gives the hunter advantages that you typically won't be able to enjoy from the ground. So it's very important that you always practice safety and wear a full body harness. But before you use a harness, make sure that all of the harness components are in good working condition. Check all of the latches and straps, as well as all of the stitching. The important thing to remember is to look it over completely to ensure that it's safe before you put it on. Before using your stand, check to see that it's properly strapped to the tree and that it's steady and sturdy. Once your safety harness is on, attach your bow to a haul line which should be positioned away from the base of the tree. Check to make sure your steps are secured to the tree or ensure that the ladder is still safely on solid level ground. Once in your stand, immediately attach your harness to the tree. This is a must and could be the difference between a safe, enjoyable hunt or a fall to the ground resulting in injury or even death. Next, pull up your bow using the haul line. Once you have your bow, place the haul line safely away from you so that you don't get tangled up in it or trip. Finally, check your safe range of motion with your bow and make sure you're free of obstructions. Well, we hope that today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect state to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with outdoor Oklahoma. Ready? Yeah. Here you go, buddy. <laughs> outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the nice. Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma.